Hi, I'm Isabel Carter, a contributor for Insurance Investor. I'm here with Michelle Darricott, the Chief Strategy Officer at Smart Pension. Michelle is going to be speaking at our Institutional Fixed Income Summit later this year on the 9th of June. And ahead of her keynote session, we wanted to catch up to gain some insight into what she might be talking about. So Michelle, welcome. Hi Isabel, how are you? I'm good. The first question that I've got for you is, what are some of the greatest challenges that are facing the global retirement market? Yeah, so um, Isabel, I think there are two main issues facing the global retirement market. Um, and I would say their coverage and adequacy. So what I mean by coverage is the number of people that are contributing to a pension. And by adequacy, I'm basically referring to the level of contributions that people are making towards their retirement savings. So to put this in a bit of context, um, even in some of the most developed pension markets like the US, there are really big gaps in terms of coverage so something like 25% of the working population in the US aren't saving towards um, on saving towards a pension, which is crazy when you think the size of, um, of the uh, global pension market is $55 trillion and the US is about half of that. So it's a massive issue from a, from a coverage perspective. The next issue, I think is around um, adequacy of contributions. So, um, as I said earlier, that's to do with how much people are putting in um, to their savings accounts um, in anticipation of retirement. So the UK did a really good job um, starting in 2012 um, through rolling out auto enrollment. And what auto enrollment achieved in the UK was it got an additional 10 million people saving towards their retirement, uh, which is great. So 10 million, 10 million more people saving towards their retirement. And the issue is that whilst we have all these people saving, um, they're, not, you know, they're not saving enough. And so there's a huge amount of discussion at government level at the moment, talking about increasing both the minimum employer and the minimum employee contribution rates. Um, but I suspect even when those rates are raised that, um, you know, we'll need to go further than the minimums in order to ensure people get the retirements that they deserve. Yeah, of course. Perfect. And then what kind of role do you think that te technology can play in trying to solve some of those challenges? Yeah, so I think that's, um, so that's a, um, a really interesting question. I think technology has a massive role to play. So um, one of the reasons why there is such low coverage in the US is because particularly for small employers, both the complexity and the cost of setting up a pension is just so high. And again, I can draw a parallel with the UK. So when SMART entered um, the market back in 2015, we were at the point of the auto enrollment cycle where employers with less than 50 employees were um, signing up to auto enrollment. And there were hundreds and thousands of these employers. And these employers had never had to set up a pension before, and it was largely viewed as a compliance task, as opposed to you know, a really attractive part of an employee benefit package. Mm -hmm. So what we were able to do with the technology was basically on a self-serve basis, enable these employers through the power of technology to set up a pension plan in less than 15 minutes. And I think we've got that down to yeah. sort of less than, less than five minutes now. And so it's about create, making it as easy as possible and creating a seamless experience through the use of technology that can really drive um, adoption rates and also potentially help people to increase their contribution rates as well, because you can use um, technology to engage people through creating really compelling user experiences to, set, to um, help them to think about what increasing, what, you know, if you increase your contribution by 50 pounds per month, what a massive difference that could make to your pension at retirement, you know, mm. due to the effects of compounding. And that's all, you know, can be made very interactive with the use of technology. Fantastic. And then do you think the institutional world is embracing technology enough or even fast enough to truly meet the demands of the future? 
Um, so again, you know, really good question, Isabel, and um, you know, something um, that we get a lot of, that I get a lot of exposure to. Um, and what I would say is, I think I think there's momentum building. So I think large financial institutions, in particular, are getting better at this. Uh, the challenge is, you know, some of these large financial institutions, there is so much invested in legacy technology, and that's a big issue. Um, for some of these large institutions to deal with. So what you're generally talking about in terms of just making the decision to adopt a new modern technology, you know, it can be a two year process um, to go through the various governance suits and everything else that you need to bring a new technology um, supplier on board. But it is getting better. And I think it's getting better because, you know, their customers are demanding um, an experience that is more akin to other areas of their lives, quite frankly. So, you know, how you and I would stream music from Spotify or buy uh, products on Amazon, people are starting to expect the same, um, you know, the same experience as they get in other aspects of their lives. And now financial mm -hmm. services providers recognize that and, um, you know, quite frankly, have to do something about it. Yeah, of course. And then kind of following off on that, what lessons do you think we can learn from other industries that are far, further along that digital curve? Yeah, so I think, um, <clears throat> so I think what we can learn is, <clears throat> you know, there has to be much more of a focus on the end customer. Mm -hmm. And again, sort of referencing my industry, which is financial services and, and technology. Um, we often we often make assumptions that what's right for us as financial services professionals is, of course, what other people want. But yeah. you know, the reality is that's that's just not the case. So, um, what I would recommend um, when introducing a new technology is to do a huge amount of customer testing. Um, you know, getting real live customers to test mm -hmm. and feedback, and that can make the process of rolling out the technology you know a bit more lengthy but when you do get something to market then um it's much, much more likely to land better and customers like the fact that they've been involved in you know in, in the production of that technology so um i would definitely encourage that i mean just to give you an example of something that happened to me recently um with one of my own um pension providers is I received a letter, I think, I think these two letters, literally two days apart, and one said to me um, that um, I needed to stop contributing into my pension because I was about to reach my um, annual allowance in terms of my pension contributions. And then two days later, I got a letter asking me if I would like to increase my contributions. <laughs> so as you, you can imagine, that is, you know, that's confusing for somebody like me, who's in the industry, can you imagine for somebody who's not in the industry how confusing that would be? So we need to get what the other sectors have got much better at over the years is, you know, how they nudge people. You know, what are those key moments of truth um, for really engaging people at the right time? So Amazon's mm -hmm. great at that. Um, you know, Spotify, when it sends um, different music selection through at, um, at different points of the week. So I just think there's a huge amount um, that we can learn from that. And that means, you know, just when you have, um, when you're recruiting people, don't just recruit people that have been in financial services for years, recruit people from other industries that can bring in new ways of thinking, quite frankly. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. I can't wait to hear more from you in June. Um, and yes, thank you for your time. Thanks, Isabel. Absolute pleasure.